In this video, I want to go through a very theoretical CFA level one exam style question on the components of interest rates. This comes from the quantitative methods topic area, and it's actually covered at the very beginning of the quantitative methods volume in your curriculum. There's a big chance that uh, you may not even read it, you may skip through it because it's very theoretical and jump into the time value of money problems. Um, however, this is something you may get asked about as well. You should know it. So if this is something you want to get right in the exam, do keep watching and let's get solving. So this is the question that I want us to cover. Which of the following is not a factor in determining interest rates? A, the size of the required maturity discount. B, the real risk-free interest rate. And C, the size of the required liquidity premium. Now, because this question is quite theoretical, uh, I've made some notes uh, because I'll need to write quite a lot of stuff for you. No numbers here. So my notes are going to be helpful. But I want to tell you about the components of the interest rate. So let me write down interest rate over here what we typically depict as um, with the symbol R. And let's have a look at what your curriculum tells us are the components of it. Well, first of all, it's going to be composed of the real risk-free rate um, or interest rate, risk-free interest rate. And interest rate, I'm just going to abbreviate as I over R, which you'll often find in finance. So what is this real risk-free rate? This is the single period, typically annual, single period interest rate for a risk-free security or risk-free investment, same thing, if no inflation is expected. So if you imagine a world without inflation, this is the rate you would like to receive normally for a risk-free investment under this assumption. Because inflation typically does exist, at least at some level in most economies, on top of this, when we create expectations of real interest rates, actual interest rates, I've, I use the term real here, which is very imprecise, because real typically means without inflation or with zero inflation, we add an inflation premium, inflation premium on top of this. And this is, uh, the inflation premium is obviously the co additional compensation, so something extra for expected inflation. So compensation for expected inflation. And because these rates are going to be forward-looking, uh, I'm using the term expected. Okay, these two added together, the real risk-free rate, so with no expectations of inflation plus the inflation premium will provide us with something known as the nominal interest rate. Although it's also risk-free, so let's write this down. So the risk-free nominal interest rate or nominal risk-free interest rate. Okay, so when you look at the answers, I can definitely, or when we look at the answer, answers, I can definitely tell that answer B as such is um, not going to be the answer to the question because it asks for the one which is not a factor, but the B is on its in its own right absolutely fine. The real risk-free interest rate is one of the factors we consider when setting interest rates. So that's not the answer to the question. Let's continue with the uh, further components. Not every investment is going to be risk-free. There are securities where there is a component of default risk, so the risk of not receiving your money back. So in the case of these, I'm going to add something known as the default risk premium. Okay, and this is going to be the compensation, additional compensation, so additional yield basically for possibility that borrowers uh, we're talking about interest rates, so something which is charged on money that's borrowed, will fail to meet or make those contracted payments. So, for example, in a bond, we have payments that are due on specific dates, coupon, principal, or nominal value, and you know, the possibility that these will not be paid either in full or on time 
uh, is, cover, is, is synonymous with default risk. And there is a default risk premium in most securities associated with this risk. Obviously, we're now outside the boundaries of risk-free investments. Okay, what's next? Well, the next one, and there's just two to go here, is something called liquidity premium. And this is definitely one of the uh, listed elements, the size of the required liquidity premium. So this is uh, going to be correct because it is a determinant which we take into account when setting interest rates or required rates of return. Now, this is once again going to be some extra compensation for the risk of loss relative to investments fair value. And I'll explain this in a moment to investments, the investments fair value. If the market in which a specific security trades isn't very liquid, you may find that although the security or the investment itself is worth an amount X, in order to actually sell it, in order to liquidate it and get your money out, you're going to have to suffer a loss as compared to its fair value, sort of its intrinsic or true value, just, as, just, just so as to encourage anybody to buy. This sometimes happens when markets, so to speak, freeze and there are no willing buyers. You have to sell your securities or your investments at a discount compared to their true worth, which on the other hand, for somebody else represents a good buying opportunity because they're buying for a cheaper or lower price, something which is worth um, significantly more. So the potential of that loss happening when you are forced to sell for uh, a value lower than the true fair value is what we call um, liquidity risk. And there is going to be a liquidity premium for those securities. So an expectation I should be earning more for those securities which don't trade in a liquid market. And finally, we're going to have something called the maturity premium. And this is, uh, well, the full extent of this will be realized when you study fixed income, or if you have already studied fixed income, so the valuation of bonds, for example, because this is additional compensation for the fact that Longer term securities, for example, bonds which have longer tenors, a longer time until maturity, will simply be more volatile and exhibit more sensitivity to what's happening in the market, more specifically to interest rate changes. So let me write this down. Compensation for increased sensitivity of long term so this is LT, long-term debt to changes in market interest rates. Once again, the idea is when interest rates in the markets fluctuate, when they go up and down, the value of um, debt securities also goes, well, not up and down, but actually down and up, down when interest rates go up, up when interest rates go down. So the direction is actually the reverse of what's happening to interest rates. However, what you'll find is that long-term instruments, for example, bonds with maturity of 30 years as opposed to two years only, uh, will be much more sensitive to these movements and will react in a more volatile way. So holding, especially these long-term securities, exposes you to more fluctuations in terms of their market value um, more sensitivity. And when buying these types of long-term debt instruments, you're going to want to be compensated for this additional risk of fluctuation in value. However, answer A, even though it talks about maturity, it actually talks about a maturity discount, which is not true. There is a maturity premium. Longer-term securities, the ones with longer maturities, require more of a return to compensate us for this risk. So, um, over here, it's a, it's a no, this should be maturity premium, but that itself makes answer A, the answer to the question, we're going to find the one which is not a factor in determining interest rates, and this is what we've done.